I came to Christ. Listen, I grew up in, in the church, and uh, but I I just kind of, I wanted to do my own thing. And, and some, some lady said to me one day, it was so legalistic, it was, you know, she said, I think football's a sin. And then I just said, well, I'm going to hell because I don't, I have no way to go to college. My parents don't have any money. I had to play football to go to college. You know, I was on a scholarship at Virginia Tech. So I just lived, I just, I lived like hell. And then when I came in the army, the Lord just started speaking to me in that still small voice, you know, and he said, I've got a plan for your life, but it'll never be fulfilled if you don't submit to me right by myself. I knelt down and, and, and asked God to, to forgive me and be the Lord of my life. But that was, anybody that says, once you come to Christ, your spiritual walk is just like this. You're going, you no, it's not. It's, it's kind of like this. I'd like to welcome you to our next episode of Plain Spoken Grace. My guest today is Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. Um, Jerry, we are thrilled that you're here today. Thank you. I want to talk a little bit about your career because you've got some pretty outstanding accomplishments, which I'm sure you get a kick out of hearing about, and they're fun for me to talk about. So currently the uh, Executive Vice President of the Family Research Council. Yep. So talk a little bit about that. Well, the Family Research Council was uh, founded by, uh, really by Dr. James Dobson uh, 35 years ago. He wanted a Washington presence for focus on the family. He knew that he needed to influence uh, public policy. So he established the Family Research Council and, uh, and it was sort of an adjunct of, uh, of, of the focus on the family for about 10 years and then he separated them. He realized that they had taken on a life of their own. And what we do is we are, uh, we focus on faith, family, and freedom, and we try to influence uh, Congress. We are a registered lobbyist organization, uh, but we also do a lot more than that. We do actually do research on families, and we believe the building block of America is the is the family. So we uh, we do a lot of research on uh, on on family issues, human sexuality. Uh, and uh, uh, religious freedom. We work hard on religious freedom. Uh, and then we, uh, we do a lot with pastors as well as we have a men's ministry that we go around the country and, uh, and speak to men. And that is, from my perspective, that's my passion, right. is talking to men. But uh, we've been there 35 years and uh, we've had, I think we've had a very positive influence on public policy and and encouraging pastors and others. Well, it's interesting to see to hear you allude to the men's ministry. I want to get to that in a few minutes. But leading into that, you had a stellar military career prior to joining the Family Research Council. Thirty-six years in the military. There's an awful lot to be proud of. It's fun from my perspective to even listen to the stories of some of the things that you've done. So I know you got to be proud. You got to have a family that's proud. Yeah. But tell me about what made you decide to join the military. Yeah, Chip, I uh, grew up in uh, eastern North Carolina. Uh, and my father was uh, the son of a, a sharecropper, uh, 10 children. And during World War II, uh, five of, of the Boykin boys out of that family were in the war. My dad was one of them, uh, and he was the only one that was wounded, as a matter of fact. He was wounded on D-Day at Normandy. Uh, driving a landing craft, but uh, th there became a family tradition. If you were a male in the Boykin family, you were expected to serve your country, not to necessarily do a career of it, but uh, right. there was an expectation that you had to you had to serve your country. So I knew at an early age that I was going to be in the army. I mean, that's what I wanted to be. You know that. Uh, that was uh, where I thought the action was. And uh, so uh, growing up, I wanted to be in the Army. And uh, so I went off to school at Virginia Tech and joined the Corps of Cadets, uh, knowing that uh, when I came out of uh, school, I was going to go straight into the Army. And uh, I did in December of 1970. Um, I raised my hand and took an oath to the Constitution of the United States and uh, went straight into the Army, and I stayed there for 36 years. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. One of the founding members of Delta Force, right. involved with the Green Beret, mm -hmm. 
and then you aspire to the level of lieutenant general. At what point in your career did you think, hey, wait a minute, I might be able to move up the ranks and make a real career out of this? Yeah, it's funny you ask that, Chip, because my dad would ask me just about every three months, are you still liking the Army? And I could never, I, I didn't know what he was getting at, but uh, you still like the Army? Yeah, Dad, I'm still enjoying it. I think I knew by the time I was a captain in the Army that this was, I was going to stay. I, I, I had a, that was the point where I was offered a job by a former a retired general that I had been an aide to. And he offered me a, a job paying about twice what I was making as a captain in the Army. And that was a point where I had to contemplate what I wanted to be doing 10 years from then. And I said, what do I want to be doing? Do I want to be leading men uh, or do I want to be working in this company? Uh, and the answer was, no, I want to be leading men. And as a result of that, I made the decision to stay in, and that, from that point on, I never looked back. Right. Well, that's outstanding. You also spent some time, after being in, serving in the Army, as the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Uh, tell me a little bit about that role, because it was just after 9-11 that you assumed that position. Where were you on 9-11? On 9-11, I was at Fort Bragg, and I was commanding all the Green Berets on 9-11. Right. So uh, we had a monumental task there to get them deployed and to get them equipped with the right, uh, the right equipment that they were going to need to fight really what was uh, an unconventional war. Uh, we knew we were going to put them in with, uh, with some really some unknown forces, like the Northern Alliance with uh, General Dostum, the notorious leader of, uh, of that, and we knew that uh, we were going to be the lead. So right after 9-11, uh, it was a great privilege to be able to command these Special Forces guys, all the Green Berets, and get them deployed into Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, to start fighting back against the Taliban. Uh, and I did that for uh, really for uh, two years. And then I uh, went on to command the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center, which was uh, the center where all the Green Berets are trained. And that was, a, that was an opportunity for us to... Down yeah, in Fort Bragg. At Fort Bragg. It yeah. was all at Fort Bragg. Right. But that was an opportunity for us to look at what they were doing on the ground and then modify the training uh, to better prepare the future Green Berets for what they were going to encounter in this environment. So... Uh, both both of those were. It was great privilege to command both of those, and and then I left there and and went to Washington for my last four years in the Army, as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence. Right. Now I had I had done a tour at CIA. My first tour as a general, uh, as a Brigadier General, was uh, two years at the Central Intelligence Agency, and and I learned a great deal there. Uh, and it was a great assignment because I, I learned a lot about intelligence, but I also really came to appreciate the, the people that, uh, that actually are out there doing the intelligence work because many of them are, are put in harm's way quite frequently as well, especially when they're in some embassies in some of those countries that are not particularly friendly. Right. They're under surveillance all the time and their, their life is quite difficult. But I realized that, uh, you know, this whole... This whole thing called intelligence is something you really have to work for. And as the guy that on the ground that had been the user of this intelligence, I came to realize a lot went into being able to provide those people on the ground or on the sea or in the air the intelligence that they needed. So uh, that, was a, that, that was also a privilege to be able to serve with them. When you started, Secretary Rumsfeld was in office? Secretary Rumsfeld was Character. There. He was quite a character. Yeah. He was uh, he he was some some days he could be absolutely the nicest guy in the world, and other days he was totally <laughs> irascible. But the bottom line was he was very serious and very committed uh, to the military and to seeing that the military had what it needed and that it was employed properly. And so I have a great respect for Rumsfeld. Right. And uh, and I, and I hated to see him go when he left. 
And so right after that, Secretary Gates comes in. So you're with him for a spell, which I'm sure was interesting as well because of his experience at the CIA. That's right. He had been the director of the CIA, and, uh, and Gates was a different personality altogether. Uh, but uh, he was also, I think, very committed to, to the mission of our military. And, and I certainly, during the time that I was there with him, and I left before the transition to the Obama administration. Correct. I left in the uh, summer of 2007. Uh, but I think that uh, I think that Gates was uh, he was there uh, with no agenda. I think he was there to uh, help strengthen the military and and like Rumsfeld to see that they were empl- employed properly. Right. I want to talk, I want to jump from that to, to another subject, but it, it, it dovetails in something you said earlier, and that is, you know, mentoring or leading men. Right. And that's really what an awful lot of what we're trying to do with these conversations is to continue to, to, to uplift men and to strengthen men and to speak to men on, on a real man-to-man level, right. which we'll talk about in, in your book in a few moments. But the first time I got to know you was actually through um, an introduction by my son. Mm-hmm. My son was at Hampton Sydney. You were teaching up there, and I kept hearing about General Boykin's class, General Boykin's class, General Boykin's class. And at the end of the uh, at the season, uh, the, the semester or whatever up there, you had a bonfire gathering with the men. And for the first time, you said to the students, hey, if you want to invite your dads, Get your dads to come up here, and I was fortunate enough to grab one of my uh, grab a chair and come up there and sit there and join you all and listen to you speak. And you were definitely speaking to these young men in a pretty profound way. So let's let's talk a little bit about that and 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 dig into. And we don't have to go, but so deep with Hampton Sydney, but the experience with the young men there. Yeah, well, I, for ten years it was a, a great privilege to be able to be with these young men, and I learned as much from them as they did from me. You know, coming out of a military environment, you know, you 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 you're not up to speed on how the next generation uh, thinks and and what's important to them and how they process information. So, <clears throat> spending ten years teaching these young men, I learned a great deal from them, and it really helped me to be more in touch with uh, what's important to these to the next generation and right. and how they think. Uh, but the night by the fire there, as we called it, uh, I brought in some other people. I yeah. was, in fact, I was the probably the least of the speakers. I brought in a guy that uh, was a retired Secret Service agent that ran the academy, that trained all the Secret Service, and he had one time he protected uh, Ronald Reagan. Mm-hmm. Then I brought in another guy that was uh, a uh, retired uh, uh, Virginia State Police, uh, a wonderful Christian man that uh, when uh, the superintendent of the police said, you, you, you chaplains, you volunteer chaplains, can no longer pray in the name of Jesus, he was the guy that stood up and said, well, then I'll no longer be a volunteer chaplain if I can't pray according to my faith. A man of great courage and sure. a man of really uh, impeccable integrity. And, uh, and then I brought in my uh, son, who uh, is a Secret Service agent today, and uh, and he spoke, and then I spoke to him, and and but we've had speakers like Oliver North to come into those events. But the point that we want those men, and they are men, you know, they they make that transition while they're there. I really think from being boys to men, right. and because what we're trying to do there was was send good men into the society that would be able to to serve their communities uh, and their families. And, but we each had a different message for them. But, uh, you know, what my message for them was, uh, look, at, look at these men around you that are talking to you today. Well, don't think that they didn't, they didn't sit right where you are right now. Don't think that they haven't been through the fire. Because every one of them here has been through some kind of difficult situation and they've, and they've gotten through it and now here they are uh, as examples to you. But... Uh, you know, my message to them really was, wh- what do you believe? Right. What do you believe? And, and that sounds like a very simple question, but you know, most people can't articulate what they believe. What do you believe in? Which really translates into what are your values? 
Because when you leave this institution, everything you believe in is going to be challenged. Yes. And you're going to have to defend it, if you, or you're going to have to compromise and just go along with the, that challenge. But what do you believe in and why do you believe it? It's not good enough that because your mom and dad taught you that. It's that that's not good enough. You've got to internalize that and you've got to know why you believe it. Do you believe in capitalism? Do you believe in, in, in our form of government? Do you believe in the word of God? Uh, is your faith important to you? If so, you better know why and you better be able to defend it. And that's where people go and get off track. And that's why 6%, according to George Barna, 6% of the people in American America have a biblical worldview. Now, what does that mean? It means you can take any issue and you can apply a biblical standard to it. So you can take Abortion. What's the, what's the biblical standard for abortion? You can take same-sex marriage. What's the biblical answer to that? Only 6% of the people, and it's probably less than 20% in the church right. that actually have a biblical worldview. So what I was trying to do in saying, know why you believe what you believe, is because I knew as soon as they walked out the doors of that institution, it was going to be challenged. And they have to have a solid foundation for what their values are and what they believe in. As a father with a son who was at that event, I knew that you were speaking to them, obviously about the responsibilities of leadership and character, but I knew that you were doing it from a perspective of your, with the strength of your faith in right. Jesus Christ and the way that you were communicating with them with that. So the first thing I'd like to say is thank you for doing that. And the second thing I'd like to say, just because they're behind the camera and you don't know, but Sam, my son who was there that, that evening, is actually behind one of the cameras. Yeah. So it's great to have him be a part of this and thank you for that. Shoals Coffee Co. Coffee Roasters is passionate about two things people, and coffee, because we want to ensure that both reach their full potential. We do our part to improve lives by purchasing coffee beans from women-owned farms in Guatemala and Colombia, along with other sources to bring you the fresh taste and quality product you deserve, while also ensuring that workers are paid fairly and treated well throughout the growing process. 100% of the profit from the sale of Shoals Coffee Co. products is poured directly back into bettering the lives of mothers and babies in communities across the U.S., as well as in the lives of women and children in the countries where we purchase our beans. Our products are available for purchase online at ShoalsCoffeeCo.com and will be delivered right to your door. So buy Shoals Coffee Co. and enjoy your coffee even more, knowing that your purchase is providing for the needs of women and children today while also impacting lives for generations to come. Shoals Coffee Co. is owned and operated by Shoals Save a Life Incorporated, a pregnancy resource center in North Alabama, and we are proud to be a sponsor of Plain Spoken Grace podcast. Let's now talk a little bit about the, the, the next step. They've left, the, they've left college. Uh, maybe some people have not gone to college, but they're now becoming young men, moving into careers, making converse, having conversation and thoughts about family. Speak a little bit about man's role in that, and a, especially from a Christian man's perspective. What, what every Christian man needs to understand is that uh, people like me, people like you, are no different than they are. You see, they... they I know that I, I went through this. I, I look at older men that were, I thought were just living the kind of life that I wanted to live in terms of their relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, only to find out when you sit down and talk to them, they've been through the same struggles, the same temptations, the same issues that I have. So when I do a men's conference, the first thing I do is I tell the men in that conference, I'm no different than you. Right. I've been through the same stuff you've been through. I've struggled the same way you have. So don't think, because I'm up here as an ordained minister now, that I'm any different than you. 
but I want to talk to you about the things that I think are important to you. And, uh, and then I talk to them about uh, their responsibilities as a man. And I, and I start by beginning, you know, by saying the word toxic should never be combined with masculinity. No. There are toxic men. Sure. But it's not because of their masculinity. And, and we've got to stop doing this because we're confusing men, we're, we're denigrating men, and we are really hurting men in terms of them being willing to step forward and be what they're called to do. Now, in my book, Man to Man, I identify five things that a man is supposed to be, and I won't try to tell you the whole book, but let me just start by saying a man is a provider. Okay, well, the obvious is he provides for the financial needs of the home, but that's the probably the least of the provision that a man provides because a man provides direction for that family. Right. And, and remember Joshua, uh, my favorite character in the Bible, Joshua. He had conquered the promised land, led the Israelites across the river, conquered the promised land, and he assembled them when he knew he was about to die. He assembled the, the Israelites, the leaders there in the desert, and he reviewed the history for them. But at the end, he said, choose ye this day which God you will serve whether the God of, of, of your fathers that they worshiped on the other side of the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you are standing now. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He was talking about his family today, tomorrow, and forever. He was setting a standard. That was direction. He provided that direction. A man provides identity. Who are you? Where do you come from? What is, what's your family history? And if you don't have one, if you, if, if you don't know what it is, then establish a legacy for your children and grandchildren and, if, and your posterity to be proud of. But a man provides identity to the family. And then a man provides leadership. And, and most importantly, a man provides a presence. There's so many fathers that are not in the home today, Chip. Yeah. And it's destroying the families. because sad. We, it's, it's sad. It's very sad. Yeah. And you have you have no no man there to mentor the the, the son, uh, to provide the loving care that a father does for the family. So a man provides presence. The second thing is a a man is a protector, and you have to protect what you hold dear. That's why it's important for you to know what your values are, why they are your values, what you believe, because you're responsible to protect that. You protect what you value. You value the Constitution of the United States. You protect it. Uh, do you value your family? You protect them, you know, and you have a responsibility to protect them from harm. And some of that harm is the harm that comes in on the airways. Some of it's the what comes in on the internet True. to pro protect them from that. You protect those that cannot protect themselves. If you say you're pro-life and you're doing absolutely nothing in the pro-life movement, then think about, is that what you should be doing? As a, If you say you're pro-life, are you... Have you asked whether you can volunteer at the local crisis pregnancy center or can you contribute to a local pro-life group or can you do something for pro-life? We all have to be involved in this fight. It's not good enough just to say I'm pro-life. And how do you vote? Do you vote for pro-life candidates or do you vote for those that kill babies in the womb? And I'm not very politically correct, by the way. I understand that, but we're, we're equally yoked on we're that. We're equally yoked yes. on that, and I know that. Yes. The third thing is a man is a is an instructor, mm -hmm. and and to be an instructor, you have to know what's going on in the world around you. You know the old saying that uh, we need to carry a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the other. I don't want to hear that you're tired of watching the news because it's so negative. That's exactly why you need to watch it because you need to know what's going on in the world around you. You're the instructor. When, when the kids ask you something about what's happening, you need to be able to explain it. But you also need to be able to explain th things through a biblical lens as the instructor. You need to know the Word of God. Mm -hmm. If you go back and look at, for example, Ephesians 6, putting on the whole armor of God. There are two themes that run through that whole thing. One theme is having a regular prayer life, going to Jesus Christ every day in your prayer life. 
and, and, and going into his presence with thanksgiving and starting your prayers by thanking him for what he's done for you. That's the first theme is prayer. The second theme is the word, reading the word, sort of the spirit. And those are the two themes that run through Ephesians 6. And that's what arms you for the challenges that you're going to face in the spiritual realm. So a man is an instructor and you need to be able to, uh, to, to make references to the Bible and explain the things that are going on in the world around you. But you're also, as an instructor, you're a mentor. And that is a role that every man, if you're not mentoring somebody, you're wrong. If you're a Christian man, I agree. you better be looking for who you can mentor. It may be your own child. Right. You, you definitely have to do that. But you ought to be looking for other men, the next generation coming along. And you need to mentor as the instructor in the family. The third thing is a man's a battle buddy. I mean, the fourth thing. A man's a battle buddy, and he has to have a battle buddy. And you know... Very few men actually have a battle buddy. It's a challenge. It is a challenge to get a battle buddy that is you can be so intimate with that you right. can you can tell him what you're struggling with and he won't compromise you. Right. He'll pray for you. Right. Or he can tell you the same thing. You can rely on him. You can call him in the middle of the night and say, I need your prayers. And you know he'll pray for you. Mm-hmm. And he'll do the same for you. Right. But that relationship is an intimate relationship that builds over time. My battle buddy, I have a couple of them. Right. One of them is Stu Weber. Dr. Stu Weber used to be with Promise Keepers. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, I'm going to leave here Sunday, and I'm going to Oregon, and I'm going to spend a week up in the mountains of Oregon elk hunting with him. And if we kill something the first day, we're still going to stay out there and we're just going to enjoy each other. And we're going to talk about a lot of things because that's what battle buddies do. But every man needs a battle buddy and he needs to be a battle buddy. That's so important to your development as a Christian man. And then finally, a man is, a man's the chaplain. Mm. A man's the chaplain in his home. A man is the chaplain in, 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 in his social group. And the Bible says, be ready in season and out of season. You know, as a young captain in the Delta Force, I had, I had tried very hard to live my faith. I was not in anybody's face. I just lived my faith. Uh, and I, I had no idea that uh, on the night of the 23rd of April, 1980, we were standing in an old Russian MiG base uh, in a hangar there, uh, the whole Delta Force, getting ready to go into Tehran, Iran, to rescue 52 American hostages that were being held by the followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini at the U.S. Embassy, which they had seized in, on the 5th of November, 1979. Uh, and this was a... This was an operation that we knew was a very high-risk operation. We knew the chances of coming home were, were not 100%, let's just right. say. And that night, the commander of the Delta Force, an old colonel named Charlie Beckwith, came up to me and said, Jerry, tomorrow morning, before we launch this operation, would you get these men together and pray for us in this operation? You know what? I had no expectation. I was a young captain. I had no expectation that he was going to ask me to pray over these men. Be ready in season and out of season. And you never know when you're going to be going down the highway and you're going to see a wreck. And I can give you a couple of examples. Yep. And and the Lord's going to say to you in your spirit, go back. Right. Go back and pray. You never know when you're going to come across upon a person that is struggling with suicide and you're going to be the one that is going to, God's going to direct you to them and you're going to be the one that's going to lead them to Christ and, 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 and save their lives. And that happens over and over and over. People that are, don't even know this person, right? but you're the chaplain, which means you've got to know the word. Right. This is another, you've got to know the word and you've got to have a regular prayer life where you're coming before the Lord. Set aside a time and come before the Lord. It's hard for a man. You know, it's hard for a man because our schedules sometimes get so, so crazy. But you've got to have a time when you come before the Lord 
and you read that, read the word first, and then come before him with thanksgiving in your heart and pray. You have to communicate. You can't have a strong marriage if you don't communicate with your wife. If you want a strong relationship with Jesus Christ, you got to talk to him. You got to then you got to stop right. and listen. Right. And here, that's the problem. Some some people don't stop praying. And sometimes we just need to stop and listen. Man is a chaplain. So that's what I see a man's role. I, I, I break it down into those five things. Right. I've often said that when I think about my, even my career or even things that we've done over the years in ministry, that about 90% of it is preparation. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes 10% participation. But you don't know when that moment will strike. And as you have said, sometimes it strikes in ways that you don't see coming or you're, you, didn't, you weren't even aware of it. The other is that we hopefully, as Christian men, are living by example. And so that somebody feels comfort in reaching out to us to actually lead that call when it happens. So that's uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an absolutely great point. So the, the five pillars in the book is, is you've got to be the provider, um, then the instructor. Number three is the defender. Then you talked about battle buddy and chaplain. And chaplain. Chaplain is such an important part, and in some ways you could put it in front of the other Others, but I don't think if you're not doing those other things leading up to it, then you've got to use that to build a foundation as the chaplain. Yeah, let me give you, uh, to all of all of your men that are watching this podcast, one of the things that, as I got into this, um, I, as I do men's conferences all, all over the country, I end that man, men's conference with something that's very important, I think. And that is a blessing. Now, I uh, I was speaking in Katy, Texas at a big men's event, an outdoor men's event. That's right outside of Houston. And they had men from all over the world there. And I had studied this, this idea of the Father's blessing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the more I studied that, the more I realized that this was so foundational to to our faith. And uh, it's, it's like uh, Jacob, when he called his, his grandsons before before he died, you know, and blessed them. And uh, I thought, you know, this is a, this is a problem because I never heard a sermon about this. This is a problem. So I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have these men come to the altar and I'm going to have them bless their sons. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have these men lay their hands on their sons. See, I can ask for a blessing for you remotely. I can I can say, Father, would you bless Chip right now? And I believe that God will honor that. But I want to bless you. Yeah. In his name. Yeah. I gotta go up there and lay my hands on you. Right. Yeah, I'm not a touchy feely guy, but I want to go up and lay my hands on you. I want you to feel my presence. And I I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ as I Put my hands on you. Well, I, I said, you men up here, you come come up here and bring your sons up here to, to this stage, and I want you to pray a blessing over them. Put your hands on them and pray a blessing over them. And then I said, I regret that my father never blessed me. Mm-hmm. He came to Christ late in life, but when he did, he was a fanatic. But he never, he didn't know he was supposed to bless me. Sure. And now that I understand it, I, I regret that my father never blessed me. Mm-hmm. As the men were coming forward, I saw a, a black man coming, a real stocky black man coming out of the crowd, you know, kind of working his way through the crowd. And I, I watched him and I, I could tell by his countenance he meant me no harm. But he came up to me and he said, I'm Pastor Charles Flowers. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. He said, if you'll let me, I'll bless you on behalf of your deceased father. He laid his hands on me and began to bless me. I'm telling you, 
spiritually, it was one of the most meaningful things that anybody had ever done for right. me. From that point on, I said, I'll never leave a men's conference that I don't give these men an opportunity to be blessed by a man of authority. So now I line the, the, the ordained ministers up at the altar and I say, if you're one of those men, like I was, that you've never had a blessing, I want you to come forward now and let these men of authority that are called and ordained by God, let them bless you. And they lay their hands on them. I hope, I mean, the there's hardly a man that doesn't get up and come forward for that. Blessing. So let me affirm this with you. You were gracious enough to come and speak. Uh, we have some we have some land where we would set up a tent and have a group of men. You were gracious enough to come and speak at our first event. Now the weather was a little janky, yeah. and we had to move inside because there was a threat of a hurricane, and the tent company canceled on us. But we pressed on. We uh, roasted that barbecue and, yeah. and had a great time. With I that. remember it well. <laughs> that was good. But at the end of the evening, you said to us, all right, dads who have sons here, and there were a number of them, yeah. I want you to get up. And I, you know, first thing you did is you brought Aaron up front. You put your hands on him. You blessed him. You showed us the way that you were going to, and then you asked each of us. And I, to this day, have friends who were there with their sons who speak very favorably and positively about how special that moment was. I know it was for me. Mm -hmm. And I also had dads who were there that didn't have their sons and said, boy, I wish I'd had that moment with them yeah. at the event. So I want to continue to uplift you in that. I think it's a fantastic thing you're doing. And there are so many men, so many men these days that are just not being affirmed that way. Mm -hmm. And they're confused and they don't know how to, to stand as firmly and strongly as they need to and so forth. So I really appreciate the fact that you're doing that with your ministry. So, Well, you. we've got Christmas coming up, or Thanksgiving and Christmas both coming up. And so I just say to, to all of the men that are watching this, grandfathers, fathers, at Christmas when you got your family assembled or at Thanksgiving when they're assembled in your house, you get your grandchildren, you get your children. And what I've done is I've done both. I, I've, I've blessed my children and then I've said, now you bless your children. Mm -hmm. And they turn around and bless their children. Or I've called just my grandchildren forward and I've blessed them. But I don't let a, one of these opportunities go by that I don't bless them. Yeah. You can't do it too many times. Yeah. I bless them. And we need to, uh, we need to keep affirming them. And, uh, and that's, I mean, you just think of how many young men are growing up today with no man in their lives. And in fact, they're growing up with the wrong men in their lives yeah. in many cases. Yeah. They need that affirmation. Yeah. I can remember a sport that I played when I was in high school. I had two different coaches. And I had a coach that was positive, reaffirming, mm -hmm. would say, you know, hey, you're doing this well, you're doing this right, keep doing this. And, and, and and I was so excited to play for a coach like right. that. And followed up with a coach who was the opposite. Don't do this. Don't do that. Right. Constantly discouraging. And it just, it, it, you know, it takes a little bit of the wind out of your sails sometimes. So I think it's absolutely important. Um, so I want to I want to kind of dial back a little okay. bit because I think there are people that are listening. Sometimes they're struggling. They're not sure what they're, where they, uh, where they stand with their faith or, or, and so forth. And, I also know that people who have been on the journey for a while have a certain maturity. Obviously, we all face the same challenges, mm -hmm. but there's a certain maturity, and people will sometimes think, well, General Boykin's so much further along in his, yeah. in his Christian life. He, I, don't, I can't really relate, but it wasn't always like that. And there was a time when you made a commitment, so it, yeah. can you elaborate a little bit about that? I will. I... Um... I came to Christ. Listen, I grew up in in the church, and uh, but I I just kind of I wanted to do my own thing. And and some some lady said to me one day, it was so legalistic. It was you know, she said, I think football's a sin. And then I just said, well, I'm going to hell because I don't I have no way to go to college. My parents don't have any money. I had to play football to go to college. You know, I was on a scholarship at Virginia Tech. So I just lived, I just, I lived like hell. And then when I came in the army, 
the Lord just started speaking to me in that still small voice, you know, and he said, I've got a plan for your life, but it'll never be fulfilled if you don't submit to me right by myself. I knelt down and, and, and asked God to, to forgive me and be the Lord of my life. But that was, anybody that says, once you come to Christ, your spiritual walk is just like this. You're going, you're, no, it's not. It's, it's kind of like this. And Chip, I, I write in my book, uh, my autobiography, Never Surrender, I write about a time when I was commanding the Delta Force, and this was 23 years after I made that commitment to Jesus Christ. I was commanding the Delta Force in uh, Mogadishu, Somalia, during the Black Hawk Down event. I was the, the ground force commander there. And I lost, uh, I lost 16 men. And I tell them about the, the, the five-ton truck that pulled back into our base with the dead on the bottom and the wounded stacked up on top of them. And when I dropped the tailgate on that truck, the blood just poured out the back like water. And it shook me. Mm -hmm. It shook me spiritually. And, uh, and that night when I, 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 I was just saying, where were you, God? Because I had prayed right before I launched the operation. I prayed, and God protect these men. And I, uh, I sat down on my bunk that night where no one could see me after we evacuated our dead and wounded, and I sat on my bunk, and I said, God, where were you? I was so angry with God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me say that again because I, I want to make sure everybody, yeah. I was angry with God. I hear you. Right. And, uh, and, and most men have been at some point. But right. I was so angry. I said, God, where were you? And then I said, there is no God. And this is 23 years. Mm -hmm. I've been serving the Lord for 23 years. I was the one that was asked to pray before we launched the mission into Iran. And here I sit, there is no God. But Chip, when I said there is no God in, in my heart, I said there is no God. The Holy Spirit spoke to me, and, and, and it was really in a, a, a very audible way. You know, God speaks to you through the Word. He speaks to you through other people. Sometimes it's the still, small voice inside. But He spoke to me. He said, if there's no God, there's no hope. And I broke, and I began to weep uncontrollably as my chest was heaving. I was saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. But take this away from what I'm saying here for all of you who are or, or seeing this broadcast. The moment I said, I'm sorry, God, I was forgiven. Mm -hmm. Before I even said it, when it was in my heart, I was forgiven. You see, there's nothing we've ever done that God will not forgive us for, nothing. And that's the problem. But too many men are still carrying the burdens Correct. after they've confessed their sins. And they've, they've slipped up somewhere. They've fallen. Well, get back up. Exactly. Confess it. Press on. Right. The, the, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Look, you're going to struggle. You're going to have moments where you wonder if God even exists, just like I did. Yeah. But, but you know, there's a guy in the Bible named Peter that, did exactly the same thing. He denied Jesus three times, sitting by a fire, an hour and a half. He denied Jesus three times, and he had walked with him, watched him raise the dead, open blind eyes, heal the lame, cast out demons. And then he sat by a fire one night and said, no, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. And he cursed. Yeah. The Bible says he cursed. You know. But the Bible says that same Peter in the book of Acts, it says that same Peter preached a sermon after Jesus had gone to be with the Father. He preached a sermon that won 3,000 people to the kingdom. He converted 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. What happened? He repented. Mm -hmm. He repented and got back in the game. Yeah. If, if you're one of those men, repent. Just confess your sins and get back in the game. You're going to struggle. There's going to be times when you're going to think, right. is there really a God? Does God really care? But yes, the answer is yes. God cares, and yes, He's real. But you're going to go through those struggles. Just 
remember, you've never done anything that he won't forgive you for. Nothing. Nothing. Part of the reason for us calling this plain spoken grace is because, and this is one of the beauties of having a conversation with somebody like you, you're plain spoken. You just call it the way you see it, and that's an absolutely refreshing thing in this day and age where so many words are parsed and so forth. But the other is the grace. And it's such a remarkable thing. It's not, thing. A human, it's not a human not at all. Uh, concept. Can't earn it. Can't buy it. It's a free gift. All you that's have to right. do is accept it. Absolutely. I understand a little bit of what you're saying. I went through a spell. We have three sons, three healthy, strong Absolutely manly sons, which is a refreshing thing to see yeah. in this day and age, yeah. with the minds of, minds of their own. And, that's, and so anyway, I'm, I'm thankful for that. But in that stretch, we actually, uh, we actually lost a daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. Sharon went full term, scheduled C-section for Monday morning. We're at church, and something doesn't feel right. So one of the friends in the Sunday school class, a nurse, says, just go and let the doctor look at you, and that way you can get a good night's sleep. You'll know everything's fine for the morning, and off to, off to the hospital we go and uh, find out that we've lost the little girl mm -hmm. and that she is going to have a C-section, but it's an emergency C-section to deliver. And you, stow, you come out of the other side of that, and you start thinking, God, I mean, here's a young lady that would have been born into a family that would have loved her and embraced her, and yet there's somebody who's a child of a crack addict. I'm not picking on that situation or that no, person. No, I get it. How is it that that person survives and this young lady does not? And as I wrestled with that and went through that with my wife, and which I would also like to say brought us closer together, didn't push us further apart right. by God's grace, um, I wondered, you know, why? Why? And as I was moving through the emotions of that, the other thing I kept praying was, I may never understand, but give me the strength, Lord, to deal with it. Yeah. And as you said, sometimes we have to get back up, especially as men, especially as leaders of our family, and just move on and continue to charge. There are so many things, Chip, that we will not understand in this life because we do not have the mind of God. Right. I stood over my 49-year-old sister in, in Norfolk, Virginia, and watched her die of breast cancer. I was standing there when she took her last breath, and she was the most wonderful Christian. And I stood over her, and I said, God, what are you doing? I was angry again. I was yeah. angry with yeah. God. And I was supposed to be a mature Christian. I said, God, what are you doing? She has a 10-year-old daughter, God. What are you doing? And again, that still, small voice said to me, I'm bringing her home. Mm -hmm. Do you really want me to leave her here? I'm bringing her home. Yeah. No, Lord. I don't understand why. Right. I don't, I mean, I'll ask God one day. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask him when I get there. Yeah. But I don't understand that. Right. I lost my granddaughter the same way you did. She, they said her first breath when she comes out of the womb is going to kill her. Mm. And she had a thing called chromosome 18. And right. uh, my daughter wouldn't abort her. Right. And her first breath killed her. And, and we held her in our arms. Yeah. And I just said, God, why? Right. Just like you did. Why? Right. Why? We'll never know no. until we get face to face correct and we can ask god yeah i think it won't matter by that time right though, you know <laughs> yeah, i think we won't really be thinking yeah, yeah, about that yeah 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 absolutely but, well i know in our situation uh you, this was going to be our third child was going to be our last child and um through the wisdom of the, of the doctors and so forth they guided us they said don't make a decision mm -hmm. whether to, at this moment if you decide you don't want to have any children afterwards then i would say um Two years later, mm -hmm. Luke is born, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know what this world would be like without him, and uh, any of the three boys. So my, anyway, yeah. I thank you for this.
What does it mean to be a man in today's world? And what does God intend for men and boys to be? Some would say that men should just sit on the sidelines, but God wants something different for His men. He wants you to stand courageous. There's an all-out deliberate assault on masculinity, and we have got to start taking back our role as men. Men, it's time. It's time to return to biblical masculinity. The women in your churches don't know how to tell you, but they really want you to be a man. At the San Courageous Men's Conference, in addition to founding Delta Force member General Jerry Boykin, you'll hear from FRC President Tony Perkins, Pastor Stu Weber, Bishop Larry Jackson, and others who will help guide you as a man to be a provider, battle buddy, instructor, defender, and chaplain in your home and in your spheres of influence. It's been a very convicting weekend for me, but I'm also encouraged. My sons enjoyed it. It's been a really great experience. God moved, the Holy Spirit moved, so many people were touched. I encourage you, if a Stand Courageous event comes to your city, get up and go. You'll hear solid biblical teaching and get tools to grow in your walk as a man. Bring your teenage sons, bring your dad, bring a friend. Stand Courageous with us. Visit StandCourageous.com for more information.